Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Henry, for that uh, marvelous introduction. I hope I can live up to, to that. Uh, I didn't know I was an architician, but um, there we go. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, forum. Um, and I'm, I've just sort of, this is my, my sort of general introduction, and I'm just looking at the relationship between architecture and geometry in a more descriptive way. Uh, I'm sort of starting off with um, this uh, painting by, attributed to Piero della Francesca called The Ideal City, which uh, really looks at the way geometry has often influenced architecture. You know, buildings seem to take on this overall geometric form. And the additional significance of this painting is that it's also uh, using perspective to show this I ideal city. Um, and uh, sort of uh, my other kind of input here is from one of the papers by Lionel March, uh, where he reviews um, uh, mathematics and architecture since 1960. Um, and um, um, he, he, he talks about uh, that architecture demands really the concrete uh, Ization of abstract mathematical statements. Um, and one of the examples he gives is this arrangement of, of blocks and looking at, the, for the same volume of building or blocks, you know, you can have a tower, you can have a small courtyard, you can have a large courtyard. And all these give different uh, 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 advantages in terms of sh uh, shadowing and, and, and really other relationships. And I think it's quite interesting that you know, the mathematics was used in, in, as a way of trying to find a rational basis for architecture. Um, and he worked with Leslie Martin on this, uh, applying these principles to uh, a proposed design for a government uh, center in Whitehall. And I think this, you know, this is one theme of the relationship between mathematics and architecture, to try and find some rules which would apply which would give advantages. But, you know, this is what we thought we were getting, but this is what we got. Uh, and that, I think that's the problem. You know, we have all this wonderful mathematical input, people, you know, the researchers like Lionel March, but it didn't have any effect. So sort of going back again to, um, to the Renaissance, I'm quite sure you're all familiar with Giotto uh, Campanelli, and uh, this idea that not only are we interested in, in geometry, but we're interested in the perception of geometry. So in, in this case, the different floors of the tower are a increase in height. So when you look at it from a normal perspective below, they all look uh, the, same, the same height. And I think we can, you know, this is a really classic example of the use of geometry in architecture. But uh, we can bring this up to date with uh, Lieberskin's building in, in, in Warsaw. Uh, which is the exact opposite, because here he's drawn a perspective, and we can look at, for example, the height of each floor and the lower floors compared with the height of the top, where he's deliberately exaggerated in the perspective. And what we get is just this horrible, dumpy building, uh, which has got nothing to do with the, the, with the original perspective. And really, it's a question if we, if we draw this, uh, we, we create this sort of artist impression, no, this is not a work of art, this is a design statement, and there's a really a question of fidelity between what was presented and what happened in reality. Rather an unfortunate contrast between uh, what happened in 1559 and what happened in uh, 2017. So taking this idea that uh, we can really think about uh, mathemat the distinction between mathematics and architecture, one is looking at, at abstract generalizations, the other one is looking at concrete particular buildings. So we have this split between mathematics and architecture, but in addition, architecture itself is split between those problem-solving, objective, quantifiable uh, aspects of architecture and the value judgments, the qualitative, the subjective. And really we get this, this distinction between what exists and what appears to exist, and architecture as something which is essentially performative, whereas uh, it could also be persuasive. And what we find, I think, is that even the balance between architecture, between what should be objective and what should be subjective, is itself subjective. Um, so we have this 
uh, use of, of appearance as an indicator of performance, but also as a sort of decoration, as a consumer of performance. Um, so when mathematics meets architecture, we move from the clear-cut world of abstraction to a world which is notionally focused on tangible buildings, but in fact is based on a kind of profusion or confusion of norms and assertions. So here we have uh, a monument to Newton, uh, and, and here we have a nuclear reactor. And one is symbolic, the other is functional. This is intentionally symbolic. This is functional, but becomes a symbol of that function. And we can say that you know, however great the geometry is, this is a generalization, not just of, of spherical buildings, of course. You know, however great the geometry is, uh, it doesn't actually necessarily mean that the architecture is great. We can have architecture based on platonic geometry. It doesn't mean to say that the building is platonic. So uh, what uh, Lionel March said, well, how can, we, how can uh, mathematics make a contribution to architecture? Because it, it, rather than just dealing with individual buildings, we can look at sort of general insights. And so I'm going to do this in terms of looking at a number of buildings, and most uh, uh, based on their manufacturability. And I'm using uh, two scales, a sort of a computational scale and an integrative scale. And I'm sort of calibrating this space with three buildings by Foster and Partners, the uh, London City Hall, which I'm calling post-rationalized, the Sage uh, Cultural Center in Gateshead, which is what we would call pre-rationalized, and uh, the British Museum, which I'm calling embedded rationality. Um, and because we have uh, Chris Williams here, <laughs> I'm assuming that he's going to talk about, uh, maybe about the British Museum yeah. a bit. Okay, so I'm not going to do, do that. But essentially we get this computational rationality strategies which really are looking at harnessing uh, not just mathematics, but mathematics which can be translated into a physical building. And just going through this, so the post-rationalized, we have this a priori design concept. Oh, we're going to do an eggy building, eggy shaped building by the river. Okay, we can't make an egg shaped building. So what we do is we post-rationalize it into a series of sheared cones, which gives uh, the, the, the um, planar panels, so which are unfoldable, and we can, we can get our building. So we are prepared to accept some modification to the geometry in order to get a, a reasonable uh, building. Um, in the case of the pre-rationalized, we have some prior acquisition of geometric uh, knowledge and fabrication principles. Uh, we select one, in this case using toroidal sections, so we know that these are going to produce planar panels and we know that those panels are repeatable. So now we can work within that solution space and we can develop a design concept within those agreed principles. Um, and then embedded rationality, over, over to Chris to talk about that. Essentially, there is no two stage, it's all in one algorithmic uh, process. Um, but of course, before we had uh, the British Museum, we had things like the Friotto grid shell, and pre-computation, we go back to things like the Munich Olympic Stadium, uh, Gaudi's uh, catenary models, uh, possibly back to the Parthenon. And we can see that there's a general sort of tradition of form finding that goes from uh, physical simulation through to computational simulation. And then it's quite interesting to compare the Parthenon, which is so essentially a monocoque construction with something like St. Paul's, where essentially it's a double facade with a cone in the middle. And so what you see is not what is there. Um, and then extending it into sort of the negative quadrant, we have like very strange buildings like Eisenman's uh, architecture faculty uh, at the University of Cincinnati. Again, a sort of a, essentially a double facade. What's on the outside has no indication of what's going to be on the inside. Um, something like the Centre Pompidou in Metz, which I'm going to call forced rationality. We will come back to that. Metaballs uh, by Bernard Franken, which is a different kind of tradition. This is really using geometry uh, to create uh, buildings which are ap apparently trying to circumvent physics. 
ending up essentially, if we have an imagination, what, is, uh, what are we using our imagination for? Are we using it to imagine a reality or imagine something which is fictional? And then saying, no, we've got to uh, turn this fictional idea into something which is manufacturable. Um, so we have architecture as a system of integration from which there may be some emergent cultural implications. Or, uh, and if you like, because it's using mathematical and scientific basis, can be part of a broader public understanding of science compared with architecture, which is really conceived as a cultural artifact. And, and it's just uh, has, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's, that's its important role and making it is a secondary consideration. So we've talked about post-rationalized, pre-rationalized, and embedded rationality, and I want to look at false rationality. Um, here we have a, a complex surface, and we've uh, intersected a series of planes at uh, 120 degree orientation um, and created a set of, uh, of, of strips which are going to be fabricated. Uh, and this is really a nice, interesting idea. At one level, it is based on the idea of the um, uh, triple uh, uh, weave, which you find in a traditional Chinese hat. And of course, this depends on the malleability of the bamboo strips. Uh, that they can be woven in, uh, in this triaxial weave form, and also that they can twist. So if we look at an individual weave, we look at the normals along there, they are not co-plane uh, co, uh, there. So what we're, what we're doing here is taking this idea, which is, works at a particular scale where the materials have a particular uh, malleability, and translating it at a different scale so that it, so we're actually uh, forcing um, the the manufactured geometry to follow a preconceived route. Um, so we have an a priori design concept, and instead of saying, "Okay, we will adapt that design concept to the manufacturing constraints," no, we are actually forcing it. We're forcing to do something which is essentially out of scale, and we're not accepting any modification to the original geometry. And in the case of um, Centre Pompidou, some of the beams, you know, there was a wastage of 80% of the material was milled away, and those beams were 15 times more expensive than a regular uh, glue lamb beam. So, uh, in the case of uh, met the Metaballs project by Bernard Frank, essentially, I want to, well, I don't know what that is doing there. Uh, we want to look at this from a science based and an arts based uh, approach. Okay, so we start off with water droplets, which is essentially, you know, the physics of surface tension. And we, from that, we um, use this idea of, this sort of art based idea of, okay, this is symbolizing purity and clean energy from the water, from the sun. And then we're making a computer simulation of that uh, using metaballs. Uh, and again, that intermediate uh, transitional representation, the image itself starts to become interpreted as some kind of a subjective presentation of technical potency. And then the whole thing has to be post-rationalized by a structural engineer um, with a frame and a skin, which has got absolutely nothing to do fr from the original um, physics principle of the surface tension and the water droplets. Uh, and what we end up with is not a scientific building, but a building which is uh, an architecture which is really an allegory of science. And, it, and it's all about the construction of this narrative of, about, and if we can, you can go on to the book website, Bernard Franklin, which, where he talks about this. Um, and effectively, we've crossed the science arts divide five times in going from the original concept to the final building. And of course, you know, the, the water droplets are tra uh, transient, the building is permanent, the, there's a complete cha different change of scale. So this is, I think, one of the dangers of using mathematics and, and sciences as a source of inspiration, not as an divorced from the implementation strategy. OK, so uh, that's. The, uh, there's one other type which didn't really fit into this diagram.
uh, which uh, I, I added in later, which is what I'm calling fake rationality. Uh, and this is, uh, this example is where a shading device has been put on the north facade of a building in the northern hemisphere. And, you know, what does this tell us about the designers or the architect's understanding of physics and sustainability? And what did he want to communicate to a wider public about uh, the need for a building to respond uh, to the environment? Um, and, uh, you know, in, in architecture, you know, we can take different elements and we can hide them or we can accentuate them. But to take a absolutely deadpan functional element and to use it in this way is, is I think, very destructive. Um, you know, when we consider that the relationship between architecture and light has been something that has been worked on for a few thousand years, um, it's, it's really strange. So I sort of um, uh, borrowed uh, a quote from T.S. Eliot, which says, you know, the ultimate treason is to do the right thing for the wrong reason. Uh, and so that's um, the sort of fake rationality. So uh, putting that diagram on one side, we've got our five rationalizations. Um, where we have this in, sort of intersection between architecture and mathematics and materials and making. Uh, we have this distinction between reality, i.e. what exists. Does the exterior or the surface impression actually indicate what is in the building? Or there's various levels of suspension of disbelief, the fake reality, the facade, which doesn't tell you about what's going on in the middle, uh, virtual reality. So how much work, essentially architecture is redefining reality. Um, but does that have to have a basis in, in physics uh, if we're just in a virtual world? Um, so and that brings us back to this idea of the distinction between mathematics as some abstract generalization and architecture being very concrete and very related to the particular and the distinction between the objective and subjective components in architecture. But I'm going to sort of turn that upside down. So given that architecture has these two components, um, and we can ask the question, what role do mathematicians see for mathematics in architecture? Um, and is it about you know, pr providing support for individual architects creating individual buildings, um, some of which have been are very impressive, um, or is it? Is there something more general to do? And I think that's alluded to in Lionel March's paper, which essentially is: yes, we can do that because we can, we can build computational tools that are more accessible. And, I, and I'm going to also use a little asterisk in here, like like Henry did, and not just mathematicians, but building physicists, computer scientists, software engineers, application developers. Um, and if you like, this could be an entry point uh, for a more rational, informed public discourse about architecture. And uh, I'd like to bring in this quote from Tom Maver. And uh, essentially what he's saying is that if we have software tools that can actually compute the performance of buildings, then by presenting these measure measurable attributes or design alternatives and making them explicit, then we force the value judgments to the surface of the design activity, and they themselves become more explicit. So this idea of that contribution of mathematics and, and, um, and tool building means that we can provide a much more uh, explicit measurements of design performance. So we can say, well, this is the cost of the building. This is, the, this is what we're getting. This is the performance. Therefore, surely the building must be more valuable than just its costs of, of construction, that additional value is the cultural value, which you know, we're not in any way denying it, but at least we can understand what is, uh, what is the performative aspect of the building and what is the persuasive aspect. So conversely, what role do architects see for mathematics in architecture? You know, is it just 
to maintain architecture as this undeconstructible blur of performance and persuasion. Okay, or you know, I think it would be really ironic if the net result of the application of mathematics to, was to make architecture more subjective rather than more objective. I think this would be, you know, how would future historians or archaeologists, you know, uh, think um, of this age? So um, my conclusion is that architecture exists the dividing line between the sort of objective and subjective ways of thinking. And essentially, it could be a, a sort of metaphor for, for society. You know, if you like, we, we really live in a post-scientific age. You know, we're gathered together here, uh, and uh, we're a significant minority who is engaged in scientific thinking. Uh, but all too often, it's just used, a lot of this is used as sort of sort of uh, cultural devices to create consumer experience. Uh, it, it's not necessarily the transmission of understanding of science, of logic, of, 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 of evidence. Um, and, you know, we're, we're architecture is a very top-down activity. You know, somebody designs a building and, you know, oh, the, hang on a second, I wasn't, you know, the public would say, I'm not involved in this building. It just arrived. I wasn't in, in, in the decision-making. And so, you know, how can we blame the majority if they appear to be unaware of sort of key issues um, or unwilling to reason about those issues uh, and who are really satisfied with uh, very simple answers to complex problems. So I think that architecture, because it is a very public um, activity uh, and it is open to this more objective approach, could be a way of communicating, uh, particularly with environmental concerns, uh, communicating to a wider public um, um, science and mathematical ideas, which at the moment are just a sort of a remit of um, a sort of specialized uh, but significant minority. So I hope that gives you some uh, context, because I'm quite sure in the rest of the um, presentations, we'll hear a lot of specific examples about software or about particular buildings that are used different mathematical principles. But the objective of this introduction was to try and set some context uh, in which to um, you know, position and review those different individual contributions. Okay, good. That was because, uh, the points that you raised, so if, if there are people who would like to react to that or ask questions in the presentation or something that's related to the presentation. Sit down. 
I think this is a very interesting question because I think at the Bartlett you have to have A level maths, you have to have a uh, school leaving exam at a high level, at an advanced level in mathematics. But uh, I, I tried to teach a first year class in kind of geometry, and you know, by the time I got to sort of cross products and dot products. I'd sort of lost the, the whole audience. And the idea, well, we don't have to do this because we can go into the workshop and play with balsa wood and make, and make models. That, 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 that was much more interesting. And I think, Chris, didn't you tell me once that your students, incoming students, didn't know what an ellipse was? Well, I think that applies to mathematicians as well. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 I mean, so, but the thing is that I, I, I thought that, um, because the students had done maths at this very high, that, that we could make this connect, we could keep this going and not let them forget all their maths. Uh, I, mean, I mean, one of the professors at the Bartlett said, yes, that by the time the students get to the kind of third year, they've, they don't know what the inverse square law, for example, is. So, uh, but if you could keep that connection going, then you, you would, it, it, it just sort of lapses. And I, so I talk to my wife about this, and I have the same problem because she's a statistician and I get statistics for breakfast, you know, so it is, it is, a, it is a problem when you sort of marry across the, 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 the divide. And she said, no, 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 they only did maths. They weren't interested in maths. They only did maths because it was a requirement. And as soon as they came out of the examination hall, it just got wiped from their brain. And that's a real, real pity because, because there is so much to, to apply. Uh, as I'm quite sure the other presentations will, will show. But going back to the city planning, I think the example, you know, there was Lionel March and Leslie Martin doing the, you know, their original research in the land use and built form research unit at, at Cambridge and looking at all these op ways of optimizing. And then there's the work on space syntax to look at uh, the sort of psychological, how can we measure uh, the, the way people move through, through spaces, what makes the space attractive. Uh, but it, uh, it all gets sort of completely wiped by the commercial um, interests. Let's look at that uh, image of the City of London. And I think that's one of the disappointments is that there is so much research, but but architecture, I didn't really, I mean, there is, a, not, not only have the sort of subjective and the objective kind of division, but there's also, which I didn't mention here, the, the economic, the commercial interests and, and the political interests which are, which you can't really discuss this with, without mentioning that, although you can go to an architecture lecture or a lecture on town planning and never really be confronted with that. 
Um, and those, those are the overriding issues. And so although, arch although architecture and design can be premeditative, you know, it's not evolutionary, actually because it is in practice so incremental that it takes on the characteristics of an unguided evolutionary process, uh, which is a, it takes a while for that, you know, you, you come in with all this idealism, oh, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna use my, my I'm gonna combine this way of rational thinking and, and poetry and, and make something beautiful, which is also functional. And unfortunately, that idealism doesn't really survive. Uh, or it's, it may, it's quite tough, I think, to maintain that vision. But I see that it's one minute past ten. Are we? Are we? So what time do we start with the uh, ten twenty? Oh, oh, oh bigger one. Okay, we have plenty of time. Okay, so I hope I hope you're not going to keep me here for twenty minutes. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, I hope this uh, works. And 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 um, you know, I mean, in what I'm not going to talk about in the other se section is the other design tools that I've worked on which are more making computation accessible to people who are not programmers. And uh, I've done a number of, of uh, systems, you know, like generative components and, and the design script. And I didn't actually, um, Emma is here from Hopkins, and one of the uh, sort of really notable buildings that, um, which uh, it, it is the velodrome at the London, uh, London Olympics, which was, which, it, which isn't on this chart because this chart is the sort of rogues, sort of uh, chart, and it, it's, it's too good to go on there. Well, no, no, not, 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 not the British Museum, but, um, uh, but uh, you know, uh, but so in that sense, um, the, the the position that I've been in is that uh, I've written software, and then completely unknown to me. Somebody's gone out and used it and produced an absolutely marvelous building. And I didn't have anything to do with it, you know, because uh, very fortunately, I, somehow I've projected into that software some of the ideas, which then are self-standing. I don't have to lecture about it. I don't have to uh, take, take people through, lead them by the hand. And so I got in this marvelous situation of, of looking at the uh, velodrome of the London Olympics and say, well, I, I didn't design this building. I just designed the software that was used to design the building. And I think that is a, a role uh, that um, maybe Lionel March is referring to. How can we kind of look at sort of uh, general principles that can be applied not to just one building, but to a whole range of buildings um, so that people who, who must be able to think logically, but are put off by regular programming languages, can use visual programming to, um, to uh, express their ideas in a, not like a drawing where the actual drawing process ends up with an artifact, which is rather difficult to change, but a program is something which you can re-execute and change and re-execute and you can put different data into it. So it's a, it's a completely different way uh, and it's also much more general. Um, you have to think about sort of edge cases and, and the scope of the program. So it, it actually has, as, as Henry said in his introduction, it's actually made a, a substantial uh, impact on architecture and design because it's provided a different medium for externalizing design ideas rather than the, the drawing. Um, and so now we have you know, hundreds, hundreds you know, thousands of people uh, who are using these uh, programming techniques um, where before they, 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 you know, there was, you could draw something, but you couldn't actually, uh, I mean, the, the classic case, the or original, one of the original cases, I don't know if you're familiar with the Waterloo um, International Railway Station by Grimshaw, uh, the, the asymmetric arch. And so it's quite, that's quite an interesting building because it was, it was drawn, it was conceived as this series of arches 
where there were some underlying rules, but each of the arches was, was different because the, 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 um, the building sort of curves around the railway tracks and it gets bigger because the platform gets bigger. So the architect came up with this idea, I got this general rule for this asymmetric arch, but each arch is potentially different. Okay, in the current computer systems of the time, which is about 1987, something like that, there was no way of recording those general rules. So each arch was hand-drawn. Okay, and so the contribution that um, my colleagues and I made was to show that with other computer software, you could actually record that general rule, what was the commonality, and then you could instantiate different examples of that going down the railway tracks to give the different arches. And the advantage of that is you could, oh, well, should we change the radius, or should we change the rules? The whole thing would update, or should we look at different implementation strategies? So instead of having to hand, and in fact, talking to the architects, the advantage that, um, the partner at Grimshaw, no, Evan Cedar said, it. you may think that the advantage was in being able to reconceptualize the building, to, 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 to vary it. Uh, but actually, what was really significant is that we can, could computer generate the details. So instead of having to hand draw the intersection of two tubes coming together at some odd angle, that could be computed. So if we made so if we did that by hand drawing, once we started to do all those hand details, we, c we were cast in concrete. We could not change that design at all because we couldn't afford the cost of re-detailing by hand. But once we have a computer system where, which can regenerate the details, we could defer to the very last moment, okay, what kind of detail do we want and what kind of configuration is that detail going to be applied to? So computation, the, re the ability to specify a rule and to be able to re-execute it is a liberating process, provided you can write the rule. So there's an obligation that you are prepared to write the rule, but there's affordances because you can recompute. So it's rather like an Excel spreadsheet. You have to agree that, yes, you're going to make the formula. Once you've done that, made that investment, then you get the benefit. So it has actually changed, I think, architecture and made it more uh, premeditative. The question now is how not to lose the intuitive, spontaneous sketchability. Um, so the next phase is to, is to not just to write the program, but to make the program something which you can now interact with using the mouse or the cursor and make it dynamic. I have a question. Mm. How do you think the possibilities to connect the arches uh, taking account uh, no logic and no logic, no logic, because the, our head is a very perfect computer. Right. Yes, I think, I, I mean, I'm hesitate because I'm, I'm, I wouldn't sort of classify myself as a mathematician, but I think the way mathematicians work and their abstractions is, is not something that everybody is, is capable or, or given to. And I think it's, it's to, to, to see relationships and to be able to 
construct some uh, uh, mathematical representation of those relationships is um, you're, 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 look, you're delving into examples and real, real cases, and then you're coming back from that and saying, okay, what's the generality of that? And how do I represent that with mathematical notation? And I, I, I think that is something which um, may, it is a, could be a barrier to, to some people. And the role, and I, think, I don't know whether you discuss in your institute mathematical education, how do you educate uh, people to be able to move across this, if you like, cognitive barrier between abstract thinking and, and, and I, I mean, I've got lot, lots of slides. One slide is, okay, in conventional drawing, I can draw a circle with a pair of compasses. I mean, I don't know whether people ever use physical drawing instruments anymore, you know, or I can compute it, you know, uh, or I can, you know, do sine and cos of a, a theta or something. And, and seeing these, say, to the students, well, all these things are, are equivalent. Um, so geometry, I think, is really quite an interesting subject because it has a sort of physical, visual component, and it has, um, and um, <clears throat> there's, there's a, a professor of computer graphics, Robin Forrest, at the University of East Anglia, and he uh, was asked by the Royal Society to write a report on the teaching of geometry in schools, and you know, why are we teaching geometry in schools? And of course, one of the reasons would be because buildings are geometric. I mean, it, it, it helps us. I mean, what, what, one of the reasons why we teach people sciences and mathematics is that so that they can understand the world around them and, and, and potentially contribute to the development of that world. And so mathematics and geometry and architecture really are a natural, or geometry is a natural connection between mathematics and architecture. Um, but then, I, in 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 the in the in the website for this forum, for the Prague section, I think you use the the Geary Building in Prague. Okay. <laughs> so, well, in the next five minutes, yeah, please discuss the relevance of everything that Robert said with respect to the Geary Building. I just, I, you know, I. I I don't know what to say, you know. That's that's all post rational. That's all. Yes. It's all. Uh, we shouldn't dwell on. Oh, we you, we jumped through hoops and we use this fantastic technology to create mm -hmm. to to realize this idea. But what was the idea? You know, if you go back to the what was it? The four books of architecture. You know, there's this division between architecture's idea and architecture as as, as a fabric. Okay. So yeah, we can use all these wonderful. You know, and and. We can, as we say, we can blur the distinction. Oh, we're using this technology, but that doesn't justify, or doesn't, you know, we can't, you know, this is a um, piece of architecture which should be evaluated, not because, uh, the means do not justify the ends. Um, and so I, I the, the, that building looks as though it's a technological building, but it's not, it's, it's this allegory approach. Uh, and what, where does that take, where does that take the general public in terms of their understanding? Of architecture or of science, so you know there was always this criticism of art. You know, when I attended my sort of art lectures at, at the RCA, you know, they said, well, you know, you know, you can make things beautiful, but the problem with art is that it can be more beautiful than nature. So art can corrupt our understanding of nature, and the way technology is used in architecture can potentially corrupt. 
our view of technology and the underlying science. So I hope I'm not going off message here. <laughs> But I, I'm quite sure in the rest of the, of the presentations we will see, you know, hopefully redeeming examples where this has made an absolutely fantastic uh, contribution and we couldn't have achieved these buildings. But is this understood? Was this intended? Or, uh, you know, there's the Zaha, uh, was it uh, Sun City building in in, not in Hong Kong, but the other enclave, um, where it's just a, a sort of rectangular slab with holes punched through it. And the, 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 the sort of diagrid wraps, oh, yeah, nice. yeah. And it wraps through and out the other side. I mean, the, just the, the brilliance of, I mean, I, I think that was done by um, front, the facade people and Vera Happel with the engineers and you know you just have to say wow congratulations to these people for doing it but the idea <laughs> you know and so we have this we have this um, these teams of people of actually brilliant uh, virtuosic people who are whose job it is is to make these ideas stand up but we should be you know taking taking off our rose-tinted glasses. I'm sorry, I, I will stop the discussion already now. Yeah. We will have time. Yes, of course, yes. I'm sorry, I've, I've had... Some three minutes to yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.